Welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. It's been a while since we've had a guest speaker at IHN, and I'm excited to, to kick it off uh, the new semester and the new school year with our first guest speaker, uh, Finn from Purica. So Finn is a nutritionist. He's worked in multiple settings from community health to coaching athletes. He's managed natural health stores, and really his passion for health inspires him to share his knowledge with others. And his fascination for medicinal mushrooms, which is the topic today, began when he started using them for performance and recovery from MMA. So besides being a nutritionist and a, and a knowledge base on mushrooms, he's also got a mean left hook, I hear. And, uh, you know, he was blown away by the results of mushrooms personally. And that <laughs> led up to his current role working with Purica. So I'll hand it over to Finn and he can take us on a mushroom journey. Thank you very much, Jason. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I can't seem to share my screen right now. Could you enable it for me? I sure can. And then that way I can get the presentation up there. There you go. Awesome. Throw that on. This is very cool. Sorry, guys. This is excellent. I love this. Okay. So hopefully you guys can all see right now what I'm seeing the presentation. I need to, sorry, give me one second. There we go. Perfect. So Jason gave me a wonderful introduction. Uh, I want to preface this by saying thank you so much for taking time out of your day to actually come and learn a little more about medicinal mushrooms. It's something I'm very passionate about, as Jason said. Um, and it wasn't always that way. In fact, I want to give you a little bit of backstory of how I got there. Jason hit the nail on the head when it was for performance, but I kind of want to retrace a few steps. See, um, I got my Bachelor of Sciences in Nutrition from Bournemouth University in the UK where I'm from, and I graduated in, a, in around 2014. And it was a really evidence-based program. It was sort of backed by the government and the local association for nutrition back there. So I learned a lot about um, biochemistry, the advanced chemistry of nutrients, eating behavior, including eating disorders, community health, all of those basic nutrition things over three years. And it was fantastic. But I kind of felt lost when I came to Canada. I'll tell you why. The reason I got into nutrition in the first place, uh, it might come as a shock, it might not, but nutrition wasn't my first choice. And that was certainly the same for a lot of my classmates at the time. Originally, I thought I was going to become a paramedic. So I was going to apply for paramedic science in university. And then last minute, I something about it, my intuition, my life experience compelled me to study nutrition instead. And uh, the reason behind it, I now realize is because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And growing up, I was actually clinically obese, diagnosed as clinically obese until about the age of 11, um, when my mom decided that wasn't the life that she wanted her kid to live. I was, because of being severely overweight, I never really wanted to participate in any sports. I'd had huge anxiety, depression, all the mental comorbidities that come along with just not feeling confident in your own body. So throughout that, throughout my formative years, I gravitated away from sports, team activities, all of these things that are really fun and really good for development. And I gravitated more towards sedentary things and solitary things like video gaming. I mean, video gaming right now, you can connect with people over the world, but not back when I was younger, it was like the PS1, it didn't have online capabilities, the Game Boy, you were kind of stuck in not doing too much. Um, and then I turned 11 and my mother had had enough. So she dragged me kicking and screaming to a karate dojo in Spain where we were living at the time. And uh, she shoved me in there and said to the sensei, I'm gonna pick him up in an hour. And I had never resented someone more in my entire life. Um, but then for that full hour, within the first 10 minutes, I fell in love with it. I was using my body, I was learning, and there wasn't that pressure of being part of a team, and I didn't feel judged. 
So I completely fell in love and then I decided that's it. I'm going to change my body. I'm going to figure stuff out. I'm going to lose some weight. So I went looking for different sources of information and I went on the internet stupidly having being young and not knowing what's real and what's good information or not. And I started learning about calories. And if you want to lose weight, you just have to eat less. So I adopted some really terrible eating behaviors, um, borderlining anorexia. I'd wake up in the morning. I would have a really small breakfast. I'd chew gum throughout the day to suppress my hunger. And then I'd eat a little bit of my dinner and then leave it and say I was full because I'd eaten for the day. So not surprisingly, I lost weight, but then I swung to the complete opposite end of the spectrum. I was very underweight, lacked energy, and that's terrible for a preteen going into, going into your teenage years as you're forming. So I, I did that for a few years, became very, very skinny. I'm quite tall. I'm around 6'5", so I was a tall teenager as well rake thin, very unhealthy, sick all the time. And then when I started, I think around the age of 15, 16, being muscular was the thing. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be muscular. And I went from one <laughs> source of bad information to the next and started looking at men's health magazines and stuff like that. and wondering why I didn't look like these um, fitness models on the front who'd either been working super hard all their life or were genetically blessed or enhanced um by different sort of peds and stuff like that so i felt very lost and obviously with my diet of uh sandwiches and supplements i wasn't getting anywhere and not seeking any professional help in the gym so i felt lost i still wasn't comfortable in my body i was still enjoying sports i wasn't comfortable in my body so when it came to applying for university i thought let's give it a shot let's figure it out and i'm really glad i did and then I got all of this knowledge in my degree and I thought, I know my stuff. And then I came to Canada and I started working in a supplement store. And that's actually where I uh, met Jason. We were colleagues together a few years ago. And uh, I came in there, I started working. I was a little skeptical uh, of supplements. I think they have their value, but to a certain point. But I felt comfortable. There were a few things I was comfortable recommending omega-3s, vitamin D, and I knew my stuff about all these nutrients, but then my knowledge stopped halfway. And there were all these things I'd never heard of before, like Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, ashwagandha. And to tell you the truth, I had no idea what medicinal mushrooms were. I knew shiitake, I knew butter mushrooms, I knew you could put them in cooking. But luckily, I was around a lot of really brilliant minds and actually graduates from the Institute of Holistic Nutrition, like Jason, one of our friends, Jeanette, and they taught me the ropes. They taught me a few different things, these really powerful supplements that have been helping people like ashwagandha, L-theanine that we were talking about before, curcumin. And then one day our rep came in and he spoke to me about medicinal mushrooms. And I told him I was into MMA. I was very sporty. I was training six days a week. Uh, my diet was on point, uh, but I was always looking for something to help enhance my performance. And he came in and he was touting all these amazing benefits of mushrooms. And I was like, and with my skeptical mind, I was thinking, I'm not sure I believe this guy. And he was like, tell you what, let me organize a training for your team. So I was like, great, let's do it. And we went for a dinner training and it was one of the best presentations I have ever been to. And I'm not sure if you remember it, Jason, but our CEO, uh, well, my CEO, also called Jason, confusingly came in and he was educating with such passion. And I could tell he was just looking at the crowd, each and every one of us, and he believed every single word that he said. There was no incongruence. And he educated with passion and vigor. And then he started speaking my language. He was throwing out research papers here, research papers there. But I was still a bit skeptical and he picked up on that. And then at the end of the presentation, we got talking. I told him about my MMA and he was like, tell you what, you don't seem convinced. Try to two products from the range, you decide, pick them. So I went for cordyceps and I went for lion's mane. I cannot tell you how much of a cheat code it was in the gym. I mean, I was training six days a week, and I just wasn't getting tired as I used to. I wasn't smashing everyone. Like back then, I think it was around three years ago, 
I had just started jujitsu, so I was still getting beaten up, but I just wasn't getting as tired. I had the cordyceps, I had the lion's mane, I was recovering quicker, I felt good, I didn't feel burnt out, and I was able to pick things up. And that was the only thing that changed. My job was the same, the way I commuted was the same, my diet was as good as I could make it. So I was like, there's something to this. And immediately I fell in love. And I said, after that training, if there was ever a time where Purica would be hiring, I'd love to be a part of the team. Fast forward three years later, uh, the same rep actually came up to me and said, we're interviewing for a position, I'd love for you to apply. Now here I am. I've been with the company over a year, just over. I started in November. So just over a year now. They're fantastic, but I'm not here to sing their songs and praise. I'm here to hopefully educate you guys as passionately about mushrooms as my CEO at the time did to me. So without further ado, sorry for the long intro. Let's get it moving. So what are mushrooms? Mushroom is the name that we give to the fruit body, the visible part of fungi. There are many other parts that we'll go over shortly, but that's typically what we characterize as a mushroom. They're eukaryotic organisms. What does this mean? This means that their DNA is enclosed within a cell, uh, within a nucleus within a cell, rather than just free, uh, free floating like prokaryotic organisms. Think your bacteria, your viruses, that sort of thing. Similar to humans, they imbibe oxygen and then they exhale carbon dioxide, unlike plants, which inhale carbon dioxide and release oxygen. There are over 5.1 million species that we know of right now, and they can be single cellular, like uh, yeasts, candida albicans, for example, or they can be multicellular, and you can find them everywhere. You can find them on your body if you have some sort of infection, like athlete's foot or ringworm. You can find them on your nature walk, sprouting from trees or the ground, or you can find them sprouting on top of your bread when you realize you should have put it away as soon as you bought it. They're literally everywhere. And they're very important parts of diverse ecosystems. They don't only serve as a food source for, for example, uh, cer certain species of insects, birds, even bears are known to eat mushrooms. They also, play a vital role in breaking down and recycling nutrients back into the soil. And in addition to this, they form symbiotic relationships with certain plant species. Um, and these relationships will be, they'll get some nutrients that are expelled from the plant, and then they will facilitate the reuptake of these nutrients while helping break down decaying matter to make them more available for these plants. So they're really cool honestly fascinating. There's so many different points that I won't be able to touch on today about how they interact with ecosystems, but it really is beautiful. If you haven't um, watched the film Fantastic Fungi yet, highly recommend it. But let's get into the life cycle of mushrooms. So typically ed edible mushrooms, the multicellular kind, so not the single cellular that we were talking about, They'll have the following, following characteristics. So as you can see, the fruit body there, that's what we consider a mushroom, but there are other parts. This fruit body serves to propagate the spores. So the spores you should be able to see down there to the right hand of your screen. The spores are kind of like the seeds of mushrooms. So they need to be propagated in order for the mushroom species to survive. So for example, if the spores haven't been released yet, <clears throat> an animal might come by, eat it, defecate and then the interlocking matrix that isn't digested will still contain the spores they'll release them so that way the spores can um, travel to other parts and then colonize the mushroom elsewhere sometimes if they're released they'll be blown on the winds and carried elsewhere but that is the purpose of the fruit body is to enclose and release the spores when needed a really cool part and something that you will have heard if you've ever listened to uh, Paul Stamet speak, he's very hot on this part of the mushroom, is the mycelium, and that's the root network. So there's a bunch of individual, kind of like chains of cells called hyphae. They bind together and they form an extensive root network. And I think, oh, I wish I had the fact right now. Um, 
I'm not sure, but if you Google online how long the longest mycelium is that they have, it runs for acres underground. Now, out of the diagram, which would you say is the part that's most interactive with the environment? If you guessed mycelium, you'd be guessing correctly. That's the part that I mentioned before that will help form those symbiotic relationships and help break down nutrients for other plants and species in the ecosystem. And in addition to this, there's tons of really novel uses they're coming out with. Um, they go over this bunch in Fantastic Fungi, but there's certain biodegradable packaging that they can make by manipulating the mycelium and growing the mycelium of a certain species of mushroom. It kind of forms this kind of looks like corrugated cardboard, but it's completely biodegradable because it comes from mycelia. Yet when you uh, apply heat to it in a certain way, it becomes rigid. So it's really good for packing electronic goods and it has a really low environmental footprint. Another really cool thing that they do with certain mycelia is they can break down crude oil spills, which is fascinating. They inoculated um, an oil spill with, oh, I wish I remember the species, but they inoculated an oil spill with the spores of a mushroom and the mycelium started forming, breaking down the organic compounds in the oil spill. And then eventually you started seeing different plants start growing on something that's usually really toxic for the environment. So there's tons of novel uses of these outside of the medicinal benefits, but we're not here to talk about those today, we're here to talk about the medicinal benefits. And before I go on and get into some examples of different species of mushroom, I want to highlight research is showing benefit to every part of the mushroom. Although the mycelia is extremely important, probably the most critical part in ecosystems, they're finding really beneficial compounds in all parts of mushrooms. And we'll get into some specific examples later, but for example, reishi, uh, you've got the fruiting body that they traditionally boiled up as a tea that was really good for helping calm people down. It helped relieve anxiety, helped aid in um, preventing sleeplessness. But they also found now modern research is finding that when you crack reishi spores, there's tons of these really beneficial compounds called triterpenes that are fantastic for modulating the immune system. So it's important to not exclude any part of a mushroom when you're thinking about it because they're very beneficial. And as science catches up and they're doing more research on this, they're find be finding beneficial compounds in every part of the mushroom. So let me get into some of the different species. Reishi, the one that I just mentioned, you can see it in the bottom right-hand corner there. It's a really beautiful mushroom. You can actually find this a lot uh, in the Pacific Northwest where we are. So if you go on nature walks and you see something like that, you can know that that's reishi. It kind of grows outwards. It's quite a hard wooden conch. And you can see there's deep red in the middle and that slowly lightens as it's growing out. It's a beautiful mushroom to see. Um, and it's actually one of the most well-researched. So reishi traditionally was used to treat a bunch of different things. They used it, they brewed up the tea, like I said, to help with anxiety, restlessness, but they also used it traditionally to treat things like hepatitis and liver conditions too. And now the research is slowly catching up to it and they're finding lots of cool things. So for example, on the stress relieving, it will help you feel calm when you take it. But what's really cool about it as well is it not only helps you feel calm, but it helps protect your body against the detrimental effects of stress. There's one study that I really like where they gave cyclists cordyceps and reishi after an intense race. So a really intense race that they've been training for for a while uh, in the triple digit kilometers, and they found that the group of cyclists that they gave the reishi and the cordyceps mix to actually didn't have the same effect on hormones um, from the overtraining that the group that didn't have it did. So what I'm trying to say is usually after you overtrain a bunch and you do a big event like that, all the stress, the physiological stress, the free radicals that are produced during the event 
they can have an impact and really lower your hormones, particularly your sex hormones like testosterone and growth hormone. And those were the two that they found in this study. And they found that in comparison to the start of the race, the group that had the ratio and the cordyceps, they actually had similar levels of the sex hormones, testosterone and growth hormone um, to what they had prior compared to the other group that experienced the symptoms of overtraining of really depressed hormone levels. So it's quite cool. It not only helps at the, uh, how do you say, the perceptual level, but also at the physiological uh, subperceptual level too. Another really cool thing it does is it helps with sleep. Now, there was a good study that showed in people with jet lag that reishi actually helps normalize the sleep schedule within around three days. And then there's other rodent models. Again, we have to be careful because as much as a rodent's physiology is similar, there are a few differences. But they found in rodent models that when they ingest reishi, it actually increases time spent in slow wave sleep. So not the REM sleep that's good for uh, kind of like mental recovery, stuff like that, but in the slow wave sleep that really helps with the regeneration and healing of your muscles. So that's really cool. Again, they found this in mice, but now that the research is catching up, that's a really cool area that they can start experimenting with and start doing that in humans. The next one is combating fatigue. This is one of the best benefits of reishi because it doesn't just combat fatigue in, like I said, the perceptual sense. It really works when the fatigue is coming from for example, a really altered physiological state. The study that I'm gonna cite here and all these references will be available after for anyone who wants them, but the study that I saw here, <clears throat> they studied people who had really debilitating illnesses. So things like uh, advanced cancer and were undergoing treatments like radiotherapy, chemotherapy that can be really draining on the body they found that the people who took reishi compared to the people who didn't undergoing treatment actually had self-perceived much better energy levels, didn't feel as depressed, they didn't feel as anxious, and they actually felt like they were able to do more things, which is huge. I mean, I don't know if any of you have had anyone close to you who suffered from a debilitating illness like cancer, but I have, and having something that can actually improve your mind state while you're going through something like that is huge. And again, I'm, I mean, of course, all of you know this, it's called the Institute of Holistic Nutrition for a reason, but to tackle such a debilitating disease like cancer, you need to have all of the three prongs going. You need to have a good mental state. You need to be having the best, uh, the best care in terms of allopathic medicine, like chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and you need to be looking after your diet as well. And having that three pronged approach, it's just going to be a lot more beneficial than just doing one of them. Another really cool thing is that it's immunomodulatory. So that means it can boost the immune response, but it can also control it. And this becomes really important in cases of, for example, anything that's autoimmune. So your rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, reishi can actually control the inflammatory immune response in the body which I find fascinating. And it's been shown in studies too, they give it to people with autoimmune disorders that can help control that response. But if you give it to people undergoing radiotherapy, it can actually boost their lymphocyte and killer T cell count that's impacted by the radiotherapy. So it's really adaptogenic in that sense and super powerful. And of course, it is anti-cancer. I'll take a look, I've got some notes here. Uh, they said the different cancers that it's effective against let me take a look right here. Reishi in particular, it was, it's active against a bunch. So you've got the lung cancer, it's active against this. These are all human cancers. It's active against lung cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and ovarian cancer. So super powerful. And again, some of these studies might be in vitro, which means they're growing the tumor cells in a petri dish. And then some of them are supported by rodent models. But if you have something that powerful that you can use alongside allopathic treatments like, uh, like chemotherapy, radiotherapy, 
it warrants further research. And I'd love to see that in the future, further research done on humans because it's been determined as safe. Can we find something that can help people get through these brutal standard treatments? I think it's an ex a very exciting area. So on to the next one, turkey tail. This mushroom is awesome. You can see down there in the bottom right hand corner, kind of resembles a turkey's tail, the little feathers and the slight uh, alterations from the darker colors to the light. This one is very, it's much more specific in nature. They've investigated turkey tail and they found it's really good at galvanizing the immune system. So really bringing it up and it's extremely anti-cancer. They actually found, so the two polysaccharides that I put down there, sorry, I forgot to say, traditionally, um, back in the day, they used to call this mushroom the mushroom of immortality, and it was thought to be the secret to living a really long life, having an increased life expectancy. They found now all of the four points that I've put down there, and research is starting to back it up. There's so much research on turkey tail for breast cancer that it's actually an, improve, an approved treatment for cancer in Japan. The PSK, so the polysaccharide crestin, one of the polysaccharides I've listed there is an approved treatment for cancer in Japan. That's how, that's how, I mean, that's mind blowing to me. Thinking something that natural is used to treat such a uh, debilitating disease is incredible. And it's something that I didn't know about four years ago. But yeah, so it's, it's very rich in PSK. PSK has been shown to actually lies so break down breast cancer cells and it's rich in PSP and they're finding now that PSP actually suppresses tumor growth in the prostate. Another really cool feature of turkey tail is when uh, patients take it, cancer patients who are undergoing chemotherapy, radiotherapy, anything where their immune system cells are going to be damaged or for example chemotherapy and radiotherapy, it can really uh, suppress, if it doesn't kill the cell it will suppress its immune response. If you take turkey tail during the therapy, it's actually fine for the therapy. It doesn't affect the cancer cells, but it actually helps preserve the immunity or the immune potential of the lymphocytes that's typically damaged when they're undergoing radiotherapy. So really cool, a lot more specific in nature. Nevertheless, a fantastic mushroom. Next one, chaga. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of chaga. Typically comes in those brownish chunks and you'll find it on birch trees, but you can actually grow it anywhere. Chaga was touted as the king of herbs for a very long time in Russia and China. And with good reason, it's got a ton of health benefits. And they're thinking that its health benefits come from its really rich antioxidant content. I mean, at Purica, we, had a, we tested a batch of our chaga and the ORAC value um, that expresses antioxidants, it came out as 50 times that as, of blueberries. So a huge amount, that's off the charts. Anyway, they think that all the benefits from chaga is actually uh, are coming from this really increased antioxidant potential. And it's really rich in certain things like I've put down there, SOD, superoxide dismutase and melanin. So superoxide dismutase, it's an enzyme that helps break down reactive oxygen species. I know you guys have probably all heard about free radicals. So those free radicals, they'll go around and they can really damage tissues. But in addition to this, once, they, uh, once they're going around and they're bound to antioxidants, antioxidants will counter their effects by binding to them, reacting with them and forming these intermediaries. They have to then be broken down and cleared by the body and that's what superoxide dismutase does. It's naturally produced by our body but in these times we're experiencing such a high level of different environmental toxins, um, stress, pollution, not getting enough rest, that they theorize that the reason chaga has so much benefit is because it's providing that uh, superoxide dismutase because our body can't produce enough of it. So it's really cool in that respect, but it's also got other antioxidants too. And the idea behind it is that they protect the cell's DNA from damage. And that's exactly what melanin does. If you think about melanin, um, that's exactly why we tan. That's why when the sun, the sun hits our skin, we start going a lot darker because melanin is being produced. It's an antioxidant that helps absorb some of the harmful UVB and prevent it damaging our skin cells. Chaga has its own melanin in there. And I'm sure it's got a 
plenty of other antioxidants that we haven't even discovered yet that do the same thing for your other cells within your body. They kind of take the hit so that your cell's DNA is protected. And that's why I personally think a lot of people that take chaga, they feel good, they feel energized and revitalized because your body's not having to deal with as much of those stresses. Another really cool thing, again, you're gonna see this as a common theme between all the mushrooms is it has really good anti-cancer effects. And I've got them in my list here, let me see. Chaga can shrink different tumor cells. So it act actively shrinks them. And again, this is uh, all from in vitro data, but they need to be studied more because these effects are really cool. It will shrink human cancer cells in, lung, in lungs, in breasts, and even in the cervical region too. It can actively shrink these tumors. So yeah, another really powerful mushroom. You'll notice all of these different functions throughout the mushrooms, they're powerful, but they're super effective. So let me go on to the next one, cordyceps. Okay, this is my favorite mushroom by far. You remember I said I tried this one in lion's mane. Those were the two first mushrooms I tried. Now there's tons of different species of cordyceps out, of, out there. A lot of the studies that are done are done on cordyceps sinensis. It's a fascinating mushroom. It's actually touted to be the rejuvenator in traditional Chinese medicine. It's said to give virility, energy, and libido. And the research is slowly catching up to it. I actually, I do have a video, but I won't show it. I'll show it at the end in the interest of time. But you'll see the shape of cordyceps right here. That's a certain species that's affectionately referred to as the zombie caterpillar fungus. And if you look down there, you can see the dark shoots. They're actually protruding from a caterpillar's head. So that lighter brown part there is the body of the caterpillar. And it's kind of fascinating what happens. I'll, I'll show you a video afterwards, but essentially the spores will infect a caterpillar and then the caterpillar will start beginning a huge ascent. So it will start climbing to a really high elevation. And as it's climbing up, it will go, it will go, it will go, it will reach a certain elevation, can't withstand the pressure. It's exhausted from the climb. It will die and then the cordyceps will burst out of its head and then the cycle will start again. Kind of sad now that I think about that the caterpillar had to die, but it's kind of a cool part of nature. Anyway, so some of the benefits for humans, don't worry, you can take cordyceps safely. That does not happen to humans. I can verify it's been four years straight. Nothing's happened to me yet. It increases, well, this is all of these, these data and these points are backed up by studies done on our specific strain of cordyceps. It's kind of a, a hybrid strain between wild cordyceps and a couple of other strains designed to maximize actives. But when they studied it in the lab, they found that increased oxygen utilization by 5%. And this is really important, not only for people uh, who have lung issues or chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, anything like that, it's really important for energy in general, because when you respire aerobically using oxygen, you can generate a ton of ATP. And that was backed up. You'll see in the next point, that same study showed that it increased available ATP by 30%, which is a huge amount. And that's, I mean, critical for anyone who's an athlete, anyone who is suffering from chronic fatigue, adrenal fatigue, you name it, anyone who needs that extra energy and not that pseudo energy that caffeine gives you by pumping out extra hormones, but actually the usable ATP, which I found really, really cool. Another cool thing about cordyceps is it's extremely antiviral. And this is where my, uh, my very makeshift props are gonna come in. But if you, uh, what, it, what it does is it produces altered nucleosides. If you think about viral replication, Viruses depend on numbers to survive. So what they'll do is, let's say you have two strands of DNA, right? You have two strands of DNA in a virus represented by the pens. Imagine between these pens, you've got kind of like rungs on a ladder that join them together, but they can separate. These rungs on each strand, they are nucleotide bases and they have to arrange in a certain order for the DNA to zip up and then 
that will code for a cell to be produced. So what viruses do in their cell replication is they will unzip their two strands. And then what will happen is they will clone another strand. So these will be the parent strands of DNA. The cell will separate. They'll get another strand, complementary st strand cloned. Boom. So now they've got the complete genetic material to form two new cells. But what happens is in this process, if there's cordyceps available, cordyceps will produce something like cordycepin. It's an altered nucleoside. And what happens is it will just bind to one of those rungs on the ladder so that when that other strand comes in and it's trying to clone, boom, it can't join. And if it can't join, the DNA can't be formed. If the DNA can't be formed, you can't get a new cell. So what happens in the case of a virus? In the case of a virus, they lack the specific machinery to be able to correct that. They die, the immune system can start battling it again. In the case of a human, you can actually, we have sophisticated cellular mechanisms that can actually correct that mistake and just keep going. So it's really powerful. And the different studies have shown that cordyceps is effective against certain types of hepatitis, the herpes virus, and more. So it's extremely antiviral. And of course, again, it's actually anti-cancer, like a lot of the other mushrooms. It's been shown to suppress the growth of different human cancers, again, in vitro. It's something that has been replicated, replicated in rodent models, but needs to, there needs to be further investigation for it. And another really cool thing is that it increases testosterone. So I say increased rather than boost, because I feel like when people hear the word boosting testosterone, they think about PEDs and they think about uh, something that boosts it outside of your physiological level. Cordyceps doesn't do that. They found that it boosts testosterone within your physiological limits. And personally, when I recommended it to people when we were working in the, um, in the supplement store, the people who found the most benefit were people who had very low te testosterone. So either Women, women with estrogen dominance, or even men with estrogen dominance, if they'd, uh, for example, been abusing certain PEDs to artificially increase their testosterone, and then they had that rebound effect. They found actually that cordyceps help level out their mood a bit more. So to me, that kind of says, okay, it's bringing your hormones back into balance a bit more, which is really cool. Wait, before I go on to lion's mane, I kind of want to come, come back to the caterpillar thing because it's kind of sad. But this caterpillar, when it's, uh, when it's making its ascent, there's a cool theory behind it. And it's still a sad story. But the cool theory is that the cordyceps actually forms one of those symbiotic relationships with the caterpillar so that it can begin its ascent. So aside from getting picked off from, let's say, a bird or a predator, the cordyceps is thought to transfer these benefits that I just mentioned to the caterpillar so it can complete its journey. So for example, it will increase its energy because it's gonna be climbing up to a really high elevation. It's antiviral to help protect it from different sort of uh, different viruses or anything that could infect the caterpillar and stop it on its journey. So while it's still a sad story, there's a bit of mutual benefit there. Anyway, on to the next one, lion's mane another one of my favorite mushrooms. This one here, really cool. You can see it in the bottom right-hand corner as always. It's said to resemble a lion's mane. I personally think it looks more like a cheerleader's pom-pom. Anyway, it was used traditionally in cooking and apparently it has a flavor akin to lobster. I've never actually tried the whole mushroom myself, but it's referred to as the mind mushroom and for very good reason. It actually helps pr uh, promote nerve growth as well as improving cognition and memory. So the really cool thing about lion's mane, what happens is that uh, the mushroom, it has these compounds in there. It's got these herinocenes, uh, sorry, hericinones and erinocenes. And respectively, they're located in the fruit body that you see there. And then the erinocenes are actually in the root network of the mushroom itself. And these compounds, once you ingest them, your body pumps it around the body, they're absorbed. And then they actually cross the blood brain barrier because they're, they're small molecules, they're small enough to do it. And then once they're in there, they stimulate nerve growth factor within the brain, which is huge because if you try and inject nerve growth factor that's responsible for uh, regrowing nerve endings, 
you're going to struggle because it's quite a large molecule and it won't cross the blood brain barrier. But lion's mane gets around this because these compounds in there can cross the blood brain barrier. So it's really cool. And what can you expect when you get nerve growth factor released in the brain? You can expect your nerve endings start growing again. And not only that, they can actually, nerve growth factor doesn't just help the nerves grow, which is important in processes like learning, retrieving memories, um, anything cognitive, they can also help remyelinate the nerves. So if you think about, I actually have a really good prop for this because my vacuum sucked up my computer charger. But if you think about the nerve fiber right here, you can see the exposed wires, right? Think of that as the nerve fiber and the myelin sheath, it's quite compromised on this cable clearly, is that rubber outer layer. So what that does, the rubber outer layer, it ensures that the nerve impulse is transmitted safely and efficiently across that nerve. So it will help remyelinate re that. And some character, I mean, certain diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, they're characterized not only by a die off of these nerve fibers, but also a decay in the myelination. Um, but in addition to this, I mean, the benefits don't just stop at the brain it actually goes throughout the entire nervous system and even the digestive system. So I put it aids digestion down there. People have found that it helps with digestion. And the theory behind that is because the gut as a system is heavily innovated. There's a ton of the peripheral nervous system in the gut. I mean, you got to think about peristalsis, right? That wave like contraction that your gut's doing the whole time to move food through. You're not even conscious of it, but it's happening. So, that requires all the nerves to be firing properly. Another really cool thing is that it will reduce nerve pain. And that comes back to what I was talking about um, or the effects that I said my, uh, the um, nerve growth factor has on increasing the myelin sheath. People typically with nerve pain, the nerve will either be compressed if it's a, a kind of injury, but also the nerve can be damaged. So that impulse can be escaping a bit. And then the body's trying to generate inflammation to stop it, stop the movement so it can heal. Right, and lion's mane by producing that nerve growth factor can help remyelinate the sheath, and then that way they're not experiencing as much pain as before. And actually, a mutual friend of ours, I've got a brilliant story about it. a mutual friend of ours, his name's Mike. He used to work at the supplement store with Jason and I, fantastic guy, but he had a terrible injury a few years ago. He was uh working on Seymour Mountain in North Vancouver, and the chairlift stopped and he was below it the chairlift stopped and there was this kid who kind of fell and was hanging on to the chairlift he slipped off the chairlift and mike caught him saved his life it's actually a pretty beautiful story he's got the letter from the prime minister for an act of bravery it's really cool but when he caught him of course because it was from such a height it was a lot of strain on his body and he really damaged his back so we caught him awkwardly damaged his back and he was bedridden for the best part of a year and that was really, really tough on him because when you're bedridden and you're not using your nerves, you start to lose it. So your muscles start to atrophy. You start getting, um, you, you, your nerves start deteriorating, your muscles atrophy, and then it's a real struggle to get back to where you were. So as he was getting back on his feet, he actually came, started working with us at Vitasave and I recommended the Purica lion's mane to him. And he was taking it by that tablespoon he was taking so much of it he took a tablespoon a day which is a ton you like traditionally you don't need that much to get the benefits but he's continued taking it now and he actually attributes a lot of his success at going through rehab of course lion's mane didn't fix all his problems again it has to be a holistic approach but he found that when he started taking it he was much better equipped to start doing the rehab exercises and healing and being able to start working out again, getting back to a normal level of musculature. And from then he's been hooked. Same thing. He's actually keeps asking me when we have a job opening at Purica, but um, he's taking it to this day and he really, really loves it. Another cool thing that I put down there, final one, it can help with anxiety and depression. And when people took these, they found that there were, uh, they had improved scores on the test that they do to test for anxiety symptoms and depressive symptoms. And they think that although 
they think that all these benefits, they can be applied to the fact that lion's mane has an ultimately calming effect on the nervous system. And my theory is the reason it can calm the nervous system is because it helps remyelinate those nerves and make sure that those impulses aren't too erratic. Now, that's just my theory based on my knowledge that I'm taking around. But to me, it kind of makes sense. And in terms of research on this mushroom, there's excellent research on it. There's good research to show that people who are suffering from cognitive decline, their symptoms were completely reversed in terms of they used a cognitive uh, test score to determine that. They found that their cognitive test score was that of a normal person, not that of someone suffering from cognitive decline. After around three weeks of having just the fruit body of lion's mane mushroom. The other, on the other hand, there are some studies that show that the uh, arenosines that I mentioned that are really potent nerve growth factor stimulators, they're found in high concentrations in the mycelium. So you're starting to see now that even though there's different areas of the mushroom, they might isolate them in research, they're finding benefits of every part. So it's very important not to exclude any when you're thinking about benefit or even studies. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll carry on from here. So now I wanted to go over why to supplement with mushrooms. And um, don't worry, this isn't a sales pitch or anything like that, but I want to show you why there are some benefits, particularly when it comes to mushrooms, of getting them from a supplement rather than getting them from whole food. So I'll break them down for you right now. Uh, my mantra on supplementation, like I said to you guys in the beginning, I believe that you should only supplement, well, one, based on your situation, and two, on something that you don't get from your diet, All right? So for example, uh, the classic example is vitamin D, right? If you're living in Canada, chances are you're not getting enough vitamin D in the winter. So it's a good thing to supplement with. In a similar vein, while mushrooms aren't essential, I hope I've helped you to realize there's a ton of benefit to them. So while they're not essential, you can get all these benefits, but in our typical diet in the Western world, we don't have these mushrooms, the whole food sources in abundance. I mean, like I said, I don't think I've tried any of these mushrooms culinarily. I can't think I have, no. I've tried some chaga tea, sorry, that's why I've tried some chaga tea, but outside of that, they're pretty hard to come by. Another reason to supplement with them is because they can be cost effective. This is if you, of course, find the right supplement, but they can be very cost effective rather than trying to import mushrooms that don't typically grow here. While we can find lion's mane, chaga, turkey tail and reishi here. One, it's very difficult because unless you're a trained mycologist, there are so many different species of mushroom, you might get the wrong one. And uh, two, they can be very expensive if you're importing them. So if you import something like cordyceps, I mean, there was, uh, I can't remember this, the price of it, but wild cordyceps goes for some obscene amount on the internet. And there was actually a scandal uh, a few years back where because it, it was so valuable and it was paid for by weight, uh, certain manufacturers were spiking it with heavy metals like lead in China, which is a horrible thing to do. But I mean, when you're charging hundreds and hundreds, even thousands for a pound of cordyceps, that's what they resorted to. Um, number three, they're safe. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this. I don't think I did throughout all of um, the, the different studies there, but they found that mushrooms are incredibly safe for humans. As long as you're not allergic to them, you can take huge amounts. They've done toxicology studies on rats. They've done some on humans. And you have to be taking a lot we're talking like above a gram per kilo like sorry multiple grams per kilo of body weight before you even get some stomach upset so they're very safe and they're a good thing to supplement with and again while i i'd like to believe it's true that everything's safe out there certainly not all supplements are safe and i know that from time in the industry um and number four they're very sensitive to their environment what i mean by that is I mean, we described how they play such an interactive role, but if you get, let's say, wild mushrooms or you forage for them, however they're grown, and let's say that year there are unfavorable conditions like pollution or adverse weather conditions, in the best case, you'll get something that's low in actives. Uh, so the typical actives in mushrooms are polysaccharides and beta-glucans. 
at best you'll get something that's low in actives at the worst you can actually get something that's detrimental to your health rather than a help because it could have environmental pollutants in there heavy metals the list goes on so if you can find a good mushroom supplement that's clean it's actually one of the better benefits over the whole food variety i also want to go over extraction and whole food very quickly so whole food is great if you can get a whole food mushroom that is brilliant because it has all the actives and it's in the way nature intended but you can't have mushrooms raw if you have them raw without cooking all of the mushroom actives are kind of locked up similar to certain vegetables you have to cook them to get some of the benefit or make them digestible it's the same with mushrooms they're locked up in this indigestible fiber so traditionally they just used to cook them or make a tea now in supplements the typical thing to do is extract and extraction is good it has its merits for one it's very cheap it's a cheap way to get um, to free up the actives so that you can take them uh, typically it's done with hot water or a solvent like grain alcohol but there are some drawbacks to extraction while it's cheap the problem is if you extract using hot water for example you will get all of the water soluble compounds let's hope let's hope you get all of the water soluble compounds but then you forego some of the fat soluble compounds and if you look up uh, arenosines they're actually fat soluble so if you're doing hot water extraction in lion's mane sure you might get some of the uh, immune modulating benefits but you're not getting the desired benefits of the nerve growth factor stimulators right so in that case you need to use um, the grain alcohol extraction and this will vary depending on species, but then once you use the grain alcohol, is someone sensitive to grain alcohol? Is someone trying to abstain from it? Um, or do they want the water soluble fractions? So these are all some things that you've got to consider when choosing a mushroom supplement. And if anyone comes to you with a mushroom supplement, no, listen, extractions, extracts have their place. If someone's coming to you and saying it's the best way, for one, they're probably lying because they have to have something more specific than that. Um, but if they have like a specific reason that's better than just, oh, this is how they used to do it X number of years ago, then that's what you've got to go for. Because if they come at you and they're just like, oh yeah, because this is how it's done years ago, we've come forward now, our understanding has come forward. And I hope I've shown you that in the previous slides. There are multiple parts of the mushroom that are beneficial and there's multiple compounds. Some are fat soluble, some are water soluble. So ideally you wanna get all of those. So I'm gonna give you a quick rundown on how to pick a mushroom supplement. Uh, that's not gonna be as biased as just go for Purica because I know everyone has their biases. I actually wanna equip you with the knowledge so that you can make your own informed decision. Go for full spectrum. What do I mean by that? Full spectrum means a mushroom that's reached the end of its life cycle so that you get the benefit of the mycelium, the fruit body, the spores. The reason I suggest full spectrum, particularly if it comes to uh, just taking it for general health, is because like I've said, there's benefits to all of these parts of a mushroom and you don't want to sacrifice one for the other. We've determined that they're safe. We've determined that humans can take them as long as they're not allergic. So why not get the maximum benefit? Unless, of course, you're looking for a specific extract for a specific condition. Number two, get them grown in a controlled environment rather than wild grown. And I know this goes against conventional wisdom, like, oh, but wild grown is the, is the best, isn't it? Not really. And the reason for that is because when you control an environment, because of how interactive mushrooms are, you can actually maximize the level of actives. So you can maximize the level of polysaccharides, beta glucans by making sure that they're grown in a controlled environment where there's no environmental pollutants. You're safeguarding them from any predators. You're making sure they're clean. You can make sure they're organic, which is the next point. When you control the environment, you can really maximize the growth potential and the actives as a, of a mushroom. And in addition to this, uh, outside of just the actives and the benefits that you can get from growing them like that, it's a lot more environmentally conscious way to get mushrooms. 
And the reason for that is imagine you're trying to get a full spectrum. So every part of the mushroom in nature, you're going out to forage. You can't. For one, you're never going to be able to find the spores if they're not grown in a controlled environment. They're microscopic. We can't really perceive them. Secondly, if you're trying to get the benefits of the mycelium, you could end up decimating a large area of an ecosystem and you don't know what um, you don't know what relationships you're affecting when you're digging up that mycelium, if you see what I mean. So ideally, to be more environmentally conscious about it, get some that are grown in a controlled environment. Of course, I already went over the organic. And at the bottom there, I've put micronized. Now, micronizing is an interesting thing. Let me go down here. Micronization is the, it's kind of an, a way of extracting but not the same as extraction. What happens in micronization, this is just a little uh, sort of diagram here to show you how the actives are bound up. But what happens in micronization is instead of using something to extract, you can use the whole substrate. So let's say you grow a mushroom in a grow bag, you've got the mycelium running through, you've got the mushroom itself, you've collected the spores in an enclosed thing. You can take the whole growth medium that has the fruit body the mycelia, the spores, everything that the mushroom excretes into its environment as it's growing, the extracellular compounds, you can get that and you can micronize it. You pass it through a jet mill, very low temperature to not damage the heat sensitive nutrients, very high pressure. And then you pass it through and what happens, this jet mill ends up breaking apart the indigestible mesh. And then you've got sieve there that the actives can make it through and then the sedimented higher molecular weight things that we can't digest, think about um, alpha glucan starches, they're left at the bottom while you get a very highly concentrated powder of actives. So if you're looking for a mushroom supplement just to get general benefit, then really micronization is the way to go. Next, okay, I did wanna include this because I think it's a really cool area. It's a bit taboo still, but slowly, I think there's becoming a paradigm shift and that's around magic mushrooms or psilocybin containing mushrooms. So the ones you can see here, this is actually a picture of psilocybe cubensis. These are fascinating. So the research is now showing that there are a lot of benefits to these kind of uh, mushrooms and in particular, the, ingredient, the compound they have in them called psilocybin for certain um, mental disorders the really cool thing about psilocybin i'll give you a breakdown of how it works psilocybin is that compound in mushrooms if you've ever had an experience it's responsible for the hallucinogenic effects um, but it's also where they're finding a lot of benefit for these conditions like anxiety depression and the reason for that is because of its different effects on the brain so what psilocybin does they're finding is when you ingest it it makes certain parts of the brain or certain nerve bundles in the brain that are associated disassociate from one another. And this might sound a little scary because I mean, uh, disassociating, you're starting to lose perception of reality. Maybe uh, your ego is dissolving, stuff like that. And that can be a bit of a ride for people, but there's benefits to that disassociation. One, it's not permanent. And two, once you disassociate a couple of nerve bundles from firing together, that opens the window for other nerve bundles to form together or other connections to be formed between different parts of the brain. So that's why you can think about people stimulating and getting, uh, getting stimulated and their creativity being um, expressed. Or you can think of uh, people having a certain event uh, that they're going to that's enhanced because they're seeing it in a different light. The nerve bundles that typically fire together are no longer firing together, so they can see it in a different light and form new connections about things. This has, I mean, so many implications, not only for creativity and learning, but also, like I said, those aforementioned diseases. I mean, think about someone with PTSD, right? They're going to a therapist to work through it, a trained uh, cognitive behavioral therapist. But every time they think about the traumatic past life event, there's the part of the brain that fires when they're retrieving a memory. 
but then as they retrieve the memory and they remember it, another part of the brain fires with all these negative, tough emotions to deal with, right? So that's your habitual state. You go into the therapy session and you don't really want to open up. You're locked up. You don't want to open up to someone, especially because those, those sort of demons are hard to deal with. Now, that will traditionally take even a trained person, depending on the individual who's suffering from this, it will take a trained cognitive behavioral therapist, sometimes months, even close to a year to break that barrier and get through to them. Now imagine if they find some benefit in psilocybin, right? And again, this is all speculative. There needs to be much more research done in this area, but now imagine if they have a psilocybin dose, those two parts of the brain are no longer firing together so now maybe they're becoming a bit more open. There's opportunity to form new connections and with the guidance of someone trained, they can start overcoming this experience. That's profound, really profound. I mean, we're going through a mental health, a pandemic of mental health right now, and it's only getting worse with the actual pandemic we're going through, right? You've got people who are really alone, and really struggling. They're suffering from anxiety, they're suffering from depression, You've got old people, and I saw a terrible news article the other day of someone being euthanized because they didn't want to suffer another lockdown, right? It's sad, and these mental conditions, they're extremely complex. So anything that can help in that regard, I think is going to be really powerful. And I'm excited. I'm excited now that the, um, now that the different forms of the vaccines are here, and as we slowly start coming out of this pandemic, the ball's gonna start rolling again on these kind of therapies because it did before this. I mean, there was a lot of hype around it and particularly in Canada, Canada's leading the way in this, which I find really cool. So hopefully now that we're coming out of the pandemic, more research dollars will be allocated then we can see, hey, is this something that we can use? You know, and now think about this, once we start discovering that, let's say we do discover it, there are benefits of these things, what now if we start combining them with the nerve growth potential of lion's mane? How much can you accelerate these new, nerve grow, uh, these new nerves growing and these new neural patterns forming in someone? I think it's a really cool area of research, very speculative right now, but as we go forward, it can be something truly exciting. I'm very excited about it. I mean, there's a ton of studies as well, even on uh, magic mushrooms and they did a, uh, reaction time in special forces snipers right so they had these special forces snipers undergo this uh, target shooting test and they did it they recorded their scores and then they gave them a dose of psilocybin and then they ran another test not the same test because that would be ridiculous they just have got a bunch of practice they can guess where they are they ran a different test still a target shooting test and what they found was it almost looked like the snipers were reacting before the target came out. Like that's how quick they were reacting. Fascinating, something to be able to enhance you cognitively to that effect, really cool. So yeah, it's a fantastic area. I'm reading a bunch about it. Um, I, think it's, I think it's gonna be the future for sure, but we'll see how it goes. Anyway, so to summarize, medicinal mushrooms can be a great addition to a supplement regime. While they're not essential, like I said, they can confer a whole bunch of health benefits. The importance now, and I hope I have given you um, enough knowledge to now start looking at different mushroom supplements, whether you're looking at it for yourself or you have clients that want to uh, experiment with them. Now you've got the idea of what you can look for. And again, I want to say, I, I know I ham hammered on about micronization a bit, but Extracts will have their place as long as someone can explain to you why. So for example, let's say someone's going through breast cancer and they say, I've got the purest extract of polysaccharide crestin from turkey tail. That's when it would make a lot of sense, right? But if someone's saying, oh, I want to use reishi for um, relaxation or immunity, you just don't know enough about the compounds that you have. We know they're very beneficial, but that's the exciting areas that we don't know which part of the mushroom is conferring the most benefit. So why lose out on a certain part of that if you're taking it for that function? We know they're safe, but there's definitely more to discover. 
So we know they're safe to be taken. And what I'm referring to when I say this is they're safe and they're effective for a ton of different health uh, outcomes, but there needs to be more research done if we start integrating them, particularly in, um, for example, cancer treatments and stuff like that. We need more data, more research dollars going into that, start funding the actual human studies. And I mean, not even getting on to the, uh, the magic mushroom side of things, but yeah, they're safe. More research needs to be campaigned for. Three, they're important parts of ecosystems. I wish I could have touched on this more. Uh, like I said, make sure you look for uh, Fantastic Fungi. It's an amazing film and it really breaks down some really cool theories about their role in ecosystems and not even just as the um, nutrient cy cyclers, but also their ability to help facilitate communication between plant species, which is really cool. It's like a different language that they're communicating with through the mycelium and researchers and top mycologists are still trying to get at um, how they do that. But that's really cool as well. So definitely, I couldn't cover that today. If you're interested in nature like I am, check out that movie, it's awesome. And the zombie caterpillar fungus video. Um, and then finally, they have profound impacts on human health. I hope I was able to confer that. They truly are an incredible species. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening, guys. I really appreciate it, especially you guys out on the East Coast, probably gone way through your dinner time, so I apologize. Um, thank you so much. And I can't say enough about the IHN, uh, not only Jason, but all the students, graduates, people I work at there. They've got a passion for knowledge and not only such a vast breadth of it, but they're able to educate people on it. And I've been a student of people like that. So I love everything that the organization is doing. And uh, thank you not only for listening to me, but being who you guys are. Awesome. Thank you so much, Finn. You're welcome. We got, some, uh, we got some questions rolling in if you're good to take some Q&A. Oh, absolutely. All right. So first up, we got uh, turkey tail is immune stimulating. Would it be contraindicated with someone who has a hyperactive immune system condition? Or would it have more of an immunomodulating effect? Turkey tail is definitely one of the more immune stimulating ones. You would see that across, I mean, across all the mushrooms, the best way to um, tackle some uh, a condition like that. So anyone who has like the autoimmune conditions, the best way to take mushrooms in that regard is taking a small amount of a variety of species. And the reason for that is a lot of them have their own immune modulating functions in their own right. So for example, when, uh, when we came out with this product, Immune 7, uh, that Purica has, they use that as an adjunct therapy for debilitating diseases because it's modulating, it's not going to stimulate it too much, right? And they found that when they were using Immune 7, they actually used it as an adjunct for people with cancer. They were giving it away for free. That was a better way to do it rather than taking an individual mushroom because they have profound effects on the immune system. And um, to your point, I used to recommend Immune 7 in the supplement store all the time because a lot of people with rheumatoid arthritis or other autoimmune flare-ups found a lot of benefit from it and they don't affect the traditional medications either. Turkey tail, I would say, is a lot more specific for cancer. And if someone's going through cancer therapy and treatment, that's where turkey tail has the benefit because they found like I said, turkey tail can help preserve the effects of lymphocytes without affecting the original treatment. But if you're tackling an autoimmune condition, best to take a variety of species at a lower dose rather than a higher dose of um, a singular species. When you can take a higher dose of the singular species is if you want to reap certain benefits. So for example, if you want a lot more energy, higher dose of cordyceps at the expense of other mushrooms. Awesome. Yeah. Next question, is there a typical shelf life? Uh, do, do the mushrooms simply lose their potency or spoil? Mushrooms can spoil, and that uh, is a great question actually. That can depend on what uh, type you have. So extracts, for example, extracts that are done in, um, uh, I don't know, grain alcohol or water, that's another benefit. The extracts will last for an extremely long time. You're looking at like, three to four years. But generally after that, mushrooms won't spoil unless they're the whole food. 
supplements. I mean, I can take a look. I've got some of the Purica ones here. Even when they're micronized, this one is December 2022. So you got a couple of years on there, right? And after that, exactly right. They they might spoil, so I wouldn't take any that are at, like too far past ex expiration, particularly if they're whole food or micronized. Um, but in addition to that, yes, they do lose their potency, particularly if they're not kept in a good environment. The polysaccharides will start to denature, break apart, and you won't get as much out of the actives. Awesome. Next question. Where can I buy these mushrooms? Oh, goodness, you can buy them anywhere. You can buy them online. Uh, where Jason and I used to work, Buy to Save, they have a really good couple of stores. They have a fantastic online store, really good prices on them. Some people sell them on Amazon. If you just Google, uh, you can Google Purica, you can find them in a bunch of places. Every natural health food store should have them. If they don't, please tell me because they should have them. Awesome. Are all mushrooms safe for pregnancy and breastfeeding or is there research lacking in that area? Very good question. Okay, so I'm glad that whoever said that mentioned this. So mushrooms are safe for people who are pregnant or breastfeeding only if they are whole food derived and the reason for that is again when i mentioned if you extract something at the expense of other compounds those haven't been studied in relation to uh, pregnancy right whereas the whole foods people consume them generally in their day-to-day -day diet so as long as they don't have crazy additions to them you can have multiple uh like a product that has multiple mushroom powders in there the, if they're micronized or whole food, you can take them safely during pregnancy. I mean, on every bottle, it's always going to say, uh, check with your medical health advisor first. I know a lot of people in our company, uh, their wives, they were taking them throughout the entire pregnancy. They were fine. Of course, you don't want to overdo it because similarly to a food, if you eat too much of a certain food during pregnancy, I think there's links with um, allergies in in the infant so don't overdo it you don't need to go crazy with them but yeah if you want to get the benefits small amounts of multiple species as long as it's not an extract awesome um would the immune seven from purica be okay for someone with lupus yes yes absolutely i've recommended it to a few people with lupus and they found benefit from it so yeah great do you know anything about the interactions between these medicinal, these medicinal mushrooms and epilepsy? Actually, no, I have no idea. Um, that's a very interesting question. I've never heard that. I, I'm not sure about that, but now that you mention it, because of the potent nerve, nerve effects of lion's mane, that would be an interesting area of research. I mean, if you think about it, if it has that calming effect on nerves, maybe there could be benefit. Um, that's speculation on my part though. And again, I wouldn't advise it just because epilepsy, particularly severe epilepsy is a serious condition. My mom used to have it actually stress induced. So be careful when you're playing about with things like that, um, unless people are willing to experiment. So you don't want to excite the nerves too much depending on the form of epilepsy. The thing that I do know has had a lot of benefit for epilepsy is actually CBD and seizures in general i think there's a um cbd at very high doses can be good for epilepsy great thank you you're welcome um having touched on the benefits of psilocybin mushrooms is there any supplementation one can take to have the benefits uh through micro dosage for day-to-day -day purposes so i i'm not sure i think the question is asking is there a supplement out there um a microdose supplement yeah Ah, <laughs> that's a tricky one. Uh, yes, yes. I think that there are a bunch of companies actually springing up now doing it. I mean, it's kind of going the same way that um, it's going the same way that uh, we did in this country. It's interesting. I kind of came here in two, 2016, September. And that was at the time where there was a bunch of dispensaries around and the cops didn't really care. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and they all got shut down and then they uh they reopened again under new license i feel like the start of that gray area is what's happening now in answer to your question i know of a certain brand called third eye nootropics not sure where you can find them but i've heard of that brand so yeah there there certainly is with this kind of thing do be careful just because it is that gray area but in terms of microdosing, definitely huge potential there. Yeah. Huge potential. So, uh, I mean, like, be careful with it. But there's, yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely huge potential there. I've, I've done some microdosing protocols myself, and it's, uh, it's, it's good. Any, any supplement right now, the issue with it, and even this third eye nootropics, I, again, I don't know, uh, there's no regulation. So how sure can you be that you're getting what you're getting, you know? So that's the only issue I've, uh, I can think about right there. So yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I would suggest if you're worried about that sort of thing and the lack of regulation, you don't know how they're being made. Um, see if you can find psilocybin mushrooms, I don't know, forage for them or something like that. And then try and do your own microdosing protocol and start at around 0.1 grams and then do your own thing from there at least you know that you have complete control over what's going on yeah and i see a couple more psilocybin questions coming and i'll just say like yeah it is it, it's a fascinating area obviously um it's not regulated by health canada or approved by the government at this point but i do know that there is a website called i think it's medicalmushrooms.com um, they're kind of following in the same footsteps that cannabis did a few years ago, where it was in this gray area of not yet legalized, but um, there was kind of ways to still get it to people. So medicalmushrooms.com or medicinalmushrooms.com, and you can um, purchase uh, mushrooms through them um, with a doctor's note from like a naturopath or another medical professional. So um, anything. Yeah. So check that out. I don't know a lot about it, but I, I did attend a, a seminar a while back and uh, they were talking about that. That just speaks to how, how far it's coming. Right. And I, I saw the, uh, there was a press release the other day by health Canada and it was uh, again, very preliminary, but they basically left the doors open for, um, for treatment of these mental disorders with psilocybin. So it's not an official statement. They haven't approved it but they've left the door open to it when it was brought up in a conference. So it's definitely yeah. happening. No, absolutely. And there was a, there was a woman in Victoria and I forget there was another a woman somewhere else in Canada mm -hmm. that got approved by the government for like government given um, psilocybin mushrooms for, um, uh, for end of life treatment. So um, they were, they were in palliative care and they, they were approved uh, for psilocybin therapy to kind of help with that existential anxiety. So that's a huge win. Um, and, you know, obviously mushrooms are available um, kind of underground and in the black market. So kudos to those women for uh, taking the steps to go through the government in order to potentially mm -hmm. open up the door for many other people. Um, okay, moving on. Sorry, sorry, one more, one more thing on the yeah. psilocybin. Um, I just want to say all of these, all of these studies that are coming out about it, just do realize that they're in treatment of a condition. Yes, right? it, it's a little different than uh, than medicinal mushrooms that confer benefit to your immune system. They've been largely deemed as safe, right? There's a lot more research on them, so before everyone gets super excited about it and starts experimenting on themselves. Yes, it's very, uh, it's within your right to do so, but try and think you can, but should you? And that's just something that I want you guys to ponder. If you're doing okay, really, is there a need to just food for thought on that one? Yeah. Um, and Finn, I don't know if you'll know this, but, um, psilocybin, is there any known effect to the digestive tract? No, not that I know of. The digestive tract. Not that I know of, but quite possibly. I mean, again, this is more just drawing on my own knowledge of the nervous system. But if your nerves are disassociating from one another, albeit temporarily, there could be 
maybe some disassociation happening at the level of the peripheral nervous system. This is just speculation um, okay. from my part. So I'm not sure, but there's potential. Do you recommend cycling through different mushrooms or is consistency better? Consistency, I would say is better. And again, this comes back to the whole like whole food uh, extract type thing, right? Like if you're including something that Purica does like the micronized whole food version of the supplements, then it's just like a food, you can do it consistently. Um, if you're doing an extract for a specific purpose, then uh, I mean, use it for that purpose and then take a bit of a break, right? That, that's what I'd say with it. And also supplement based on your situation. Like if I have a huge training volume, I'm working uh, similar to what I'm doing now, I'll just be taking cordyceps for as long as I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. Lion's mane is something that I take every day as well. Cause I mean, doing kickboxing, kickboxing, jujitsu, I take a lot of knocks to the head. It's something I'm very paranoid about. So I like to take lion's mane all the time. Um, but in terms of to get the benefit from it, as I'm aware, you will get the benefits as long as you're consistent with it. There may be, for example, like the more adaptogenic ones like reishi, maybe that's something that you should just use again, when you're wanting to stimulate your immune system, get that immunomodulating effect and stuff like that. Great. Um, where does Purica source their mushrooms from? Purica grows them. So they grow them. That's a great question. They get them from a, uh, a company called Aloha Medicinals that's in the States, but then now we're working with the, uh, the owner of that company, Dr. John Holiday, who's like a fabulous mycologist. I'll have to try to get him, um, get him here sometime because he's just a true wealth of knowledge. Uh, he, he made that company. So that's where we get our micronized mushrooms from. He's actually helping us build our own facility uh, in Duncan on the island. So hopefully COVID put a spanner in the works, but hopefully 2021, tail end of the year, they'll be 100% grown and produced on Vancouver Island. But right now, just in the States. That's exciting. Yeah, I'm super, I'm pumped about that. Should mushroom supplements be taken with or without food? That's a great question. I would say with food because there are some fat soluble compounds in there that you want to get the benefits from, right? And uh, there's nothing that I know of that interferes with the absorption. I haven't seen any studies that say that the absorption is impaired when you have any sort of food source. And they have been studied with like dairy and a bunch of other things. So yeah. I would say even with Fuchs, there's fat soluble constituents in there that you want to absorb. Or if you like, let's say you're taking uh, supplements in the morning and you've got an omega-3, that's fine. Take those together. Beautiful. Um, how long would be a good recommended time for a therapeutic dose of lion's mane to help improve short-term memory? Sorry, a therapeutic dose of lion's mane to improve short-term yeah. memory? How long, like what, what, what would be a recommended amount of time to see benefits to, to short-term memory? I mean, you're taking, if you're doing like five grams a day, like a teaspoon, I always use like our powders for reference because it's just where I work. But if you're taking a good amount like that, within two weeks, you feel the benefits. Like lion's mane is one of those where if generally your memory is good, you might not feel it initially, but then when you come off it, you'll start noticing you're not able to focus as well. and when you're not focusing, you don't encode memories as well because you're dieting from everywhere and you're not really paying attention. The people who self-diagnose themselves as having poor memory actually see benefit. I literally can't think of anyone who hasn't felt the benefit within two weeks. So two weeks, I'd say, if you're really worried about it, take around five grams a day. That's one teaspoon or it's maybe two, four, around six caps. Okay. Um do you know of any adverse reactions to some of these mushrooms, like specifically allergic reactions? No, not purica mushrooms. And interestingly, they think, and this is something that my uh, CEO has told me, but they think that reactions to different mushrooms actually happen because of contaminants in the mushrooms. So there might be other molds, uh, other fungi that have grown on it. There might be contaminants that your body's reacting to rather than the mushroom itself because actual mushroom allergy is really rare and that's another point i forgot to um mention in the presentation so thank you 
look for a supplement that's third party tested. They can provide the certificates of analysis. They can show you that there's very low levels of indigestible stuff like alpha glucans, because that really has no business in a supplement that you want to digest. They have no levels of heavy metals. They have no levels of molds and that they have a good level of actives in there. So if you do that, mushroom allergies are quite rare. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all the information, Finn. Uh, where can people learn more about Purica or, or mushrooms? Uh, they can learn a bunch, honestly, from our website. If you go to purica.com, bunch of different resources on there on all the different products we have. Uh, you can look at different videos. Again, I'd really suggest watching the, um, the Fantastic Fungi. And actually, if any of you like podcasts, do yourself a favor and listen to the first Joe Rogan experience that Paul Stamets did. So there's two episodes. Don't listen to the most recent one. Listen to the one before that. Fascinating conversation. I actually remember, uh, I remember doing the dishes and I was just like a mouth open the entire time listening to that podcast. It's really good. It stimulates uh, some creativity. And yeah, and then for anything else, head to Purica and there's options to contact. If you have more specific questions, they can definitely help you out. Awesome. And um, how, how, are we, I, how are we going to do a draw? Oh, that's very good, actually. We should do this. So I tell you what, anyone who wants to do a draw, if you could, do they all have your email, Jason? Yep. They should. If they don't, it's jason at instituteofholisticnutrition.com. Awesome. Okay. Tell you what, email Jason. One thing that stood out to you from the presentation, one thing new that you learned about mushrooms and everyone who emails, and it was actually in the presentation, then we'll go through, we'll draw a name, and then we can get some good Purica products to you. Awesome. Sweet. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending. I hope that was informative. Finn, thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, all the best. All the best. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it.